So here is a woman, she's a housewife. Here is a man, he's a soldier, and there's another man, he's a beggar. All three of them experienced a miracle. And with every miracle, God has something to say to the people. With every parable, God is saying something to his people. Some miracles say some things to some people. Some parables have something else to say to some other people. Depending on where you are and what God wants to do in your life, you have to hear the voice of the Spirit. Because what you hear is going to determine what you're going to understand and what you're going to perceive. And what you see is what you are going to pursue. We all have to hear something. So here is a woman. She's a housewife. But she has the issue of blood. And she spent all her money trying to get well. And when she was exhausted, she had no more money left. Then she decided to do something that she should have done long ago. And she said to herself, if only I can touch the hem of his garment. If I can only touch his clothes, I will be made whole. The moment God speaks to you on the inside, everything about your world starts to change. If God has not spoken to you, then everything you do is questionable. Every goal that you pursue can be challenged. If God is not the source, if God has not instructed you to do what you're doing, what are you doing? <laughs> because whatever you are doing, it's going to be challenged by the things and by the systems of this world. In Exodus 39, God gives Moses a commandment and he says to, he says to Moses, this is how you should dress your brother. <laughs> so this is his clothes. You dress him up in a particular way because everything that is on this dress has a specific prophetic message. And now the gown of the high priest, the first high priest was Aaron. And his gown right at the bottom of the gown or of the garment, they had to now embroider with purple and deep red and so on, pomegranates. So there was fruit that was supposed to be right there where the movement is when the high priest moves. Come on. And between the pomegranates, then you must also make bells of gold so that you can understand the prophetic message is this, that if you are in the spirit and you produce the fruit, everyone will know about it. There will be a sound about you when you move with him who has called you to do what you are doing. If you are doing the right thing, whether it is in business, whether it is in, in politics, whether it is in the education, agriculture, doesn't matter. If you're doing the right thing, there will be results. And when there's results, there will be a sound. There will be a confirmation. God will move with you and people will know that God is with that man. Whatever it is he's doing. She can be a housewife. But she has a struggle and she has an enemy and she has a problem. She has a mountain to face. And suddenly she hears a word in her spirit. The high priest, spoken about by Moses, that high priest promised by the Bible, is not the high priest in the system. It's a high priest in a dimension and that high priest is in Jerusalem now. And if you could just reach out to that high priest and touch his garment, you'll be made whole because God said, out of his presence and in his presence, there is fullness of everything you need. And God, by the spirit of, of grace, God opens up her eyes to see that the high priest is not in the temple anymore. That's the high priest from a system. The high priest is in Jerusalem. He's a, he's a man moving in a dimension and just come close to him and you will see everything you need will come to you. So she moves, but she doesn't tell anyone. She's so persuaded that she does not take anyone with her. She does not need people to encourage her. She does not need people to, to strengthen her faith. She's so persuaded that she says, I can do it in secret. 
You see, the ministry of the high priest was kind of a secret ministry. Once a year, behind the veil, nobody saw what he was doing. Only the high priest and God. And when he works, we can't even watch him work. His work is between him and God. So it's very private. And this woman's faith, she's calling for a miracle, but it's very secretive. She doesn't tell anyone. She doesn't even tell the Lord. It's between, he, it's between her and the Spirit. Because the Spirit is moving her. Come on, it's not normal for people to do this. Who told her if she can touch his garment that she'll be made whole? She just knew. If the high priest is no longer in the Holy of Holies, but he's in the outer court, if I touch him in the outer court, whatever is promised in the Holy of Holies will manifest in the outer court. That's faith. So now she goes and she presses through and the moment she touches the hem of his garment, bam, Jesus is on a mission to go and heal a little girl that had died. <laughs> He's not interested in the mission Suddenly something happens, not in the system, but in the dimension. He feels power flowing out of him. And he says, who touched me? Because there can be no release of power unless you touch him. You have to touch him with your faith. You have to touch him in prayer. You have to touch him in your praise. You have to touch him in your worship. You have to touch him in your service. You have to touch him in being diligent, in being constant, in being everything that you know you ought to do at the workplace, at home, in, in your relationship, everything. There's always the opportunity. There's always an open door for you to touch him. But you cannot touch him unless you make up your mind. You have to be single-minded. You can't touch everything. And expect something from God. So Peter and James and all the others said, Lord, we're all touching you. He says, but have any of you felt the power come into you? I'm not talking about the touch that's natural. Not in the system. I'm talking about in the dimension. Because all the time he was showing them a kingdom that was not from this world. You see, this is our challenge. We say yes to Jesus and then we go with our Jesus into our own previous kingdom, and we want Jesus to be at home there. Jesus finds you there. Jesus rescues you there, but Jesus does not want to live there. Jesus has got his own kingdom. So you and I have to go to another kingdom. This is why we come to church to hear more truth that will persuade us to finally enter into a kingdom that you cannot see. Come on. Everybody is happy when everything they see is as they want it. And now everybody is unhappy when things don't work out the way they expected it. Things are not as you see it. Things are not as it seems right now. So now the power flows and, and Jesus continues to say, I want to know who touched me. So he's looking around and everything and everyone stops. The Bible says then this woman, she discovered, she saw that she cannot be hidden. So she didn't ask for a miracle to say, well, wow, I got great faith. Look at me now. I got more than you got. No, this was really a private personal issue between her and her God. It's profound. While she's shaking and she's concerned, now she, she, she realizes she's, she's found out. Finally, she falls in front of Jesus, the Bible says, and she tells in front of all of the people, okay, it was me. I took his power. I'm sorry, I'll give it back. <laughs> then she came and she said, Lord, uh, uh, this is what I did. I, I just said to myself, if I can just touch the hem of your garment. What do you see in my garment, woman? Who told you that if you touch the hem of my garment, you'll be well? Who told you that I carry the pomegranates because he did not dress like the high priest in Jerusalem? It was not obvious in the natural. She said, Lord, I, I was moved by the Spirit. Jesus said to her, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I said to myself, Lord, but why? 
What is the message? Why did you make such a thing about her miracle? The Lord said to me, page four chapters further. Because this story is recorded in Matthew chapter 9. But let's go to Matthew chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. You see, this was the purpose. Now she has declared to the nation what she had done. She touched the hem of his garment. Now, some time later, watch this, guys. Five chapters down the line. Jesus is in one place. And when the men of that place recognized him, when they saw him, what did they see? When they saw him, what did they remember? When they saw him, what was their calculation? When they saw him, what did they think? They had one thing in their minds. This man has the stuff. <laughs> he produces what is necessary. Then they sent out into all the surrounding region. They brought to him all who were sick. Come on, if you bring all the sick. All the sick. Uh, that's quite an operation. That's a big crowd. That's a lot of people. They brought all who were sick and begged him that they might only watch the touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched it were made perfectly well wow that's powerful so jesus wanted them all to know that her private miracle is now public domain <laughs> so she had something to say to the nation what was her message he is the great high priest. Come on. Second miracle. The first one was a housewife. The second one is a beggar. Mark chapter 10. Verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and the great multitude... Watch this now. Blind Bartimaeus. Say with me, blind Bartimaeus. The son of Timaeus. Okay, that was. The son of Timaeus sat by the road begging. So here is a man, he's a beggar and he's blind. So he's really at the bottom of the food chain. I mean, you don't have to respond or listen to beggars. Now, if he's blind, you can just walk softly. He's not going to know you were there. So you can really get out of this thing without paying a cent. And if you really want to bless him, you make big noise. You say, this is Wally giving you 10 rand, right? <laughs> Remember the name. I mean the woman that was a housewife. We don't even know what her name was. All we know is what her condition was. Then we know about a miracle. And then her miracle became the public domain. And everybody got healed to touch him of his garment. They just said, please, Lord, can we just touch your garment? Can we just buy into the miracle that that woman, who we don't even know what her name was, but she got well, and they all got healed. Here is a, here's a beggar. Nobody has to listen to him. He's even blind. And guess what? The Bible knows his name. God knows him. <laughs> so God knows his name. God even knows the family tree. He says his name is Bartimaeus. He's the son of Timaeus. I just find it striking. How God does not look at people the way we look at them. That God knows everyone by name. And God will come to your, your world, in your life, ordinary people, in ordinary circumstances. And take your situation and make it a message to the generation. He sat by the road begging, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, now say, so how did he hear that? He couldn't see it. So he had to ask some questions. So this guy was, he was not just asking for money. He was, he was on the gang. This guy was going. He must have asked someone, Who's, what's the whole commotion about? They said to him, it's Jesus. He said, Jesus of Nazareth? Then he began to cry out and say, listen, between hearing that it was Jesus and now calling to Jesus, something profound had to happen inside him in a split second. Yeah, he realized suddenly, this is my only opportunity. This is the window of opportunity of opportunities. I'm never going to have this again. So, so I better speak to him in a way that it will draw his attention. I, I better capture something about him that no one else has captured. <laughs> 
I better see something now about this man that nobody else has ever seen, uh, but you can't even see. Yeah, but I mean on the inside. Uh, I better see something when those people who can't see, can't see. Uh, I might be blind, but I'm not dumb and deaf. This man is obviously not ordinary. He's got power from heaven. Who can this man be? You know what he says? Suddenly a word <laughs> explodes in his spirit. He is the son of David. How can he be the son of David? He's not Solomon. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the system. I'm talking about the dimension. And in a moment he captures who Jesus is in the spirit. The authority that he has. That he is the son of David. That David's life, David's reign, David's rule, David's position as a king was a prophecy in the old towards a time when the son of God would come in the new. That it would be the owner of the kingdom, the one who owns the kingdom. The one for whom and to whom the kingdom speaks that David was just a a shadow and a type. Because the son is the heir, isn't it? The son is the one who, who owns it, who inherits it. So as he sees that this man is the king that David was trying to bring the attention to in everything he wrote, he said he owns the kingdom. He has the power. He has the authority. He's the son of David. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He says mercy, because mercy triumphs over judgment. So if there's anything that brings judgment against me because of the past or the present or any other time, God, I'm calling for mercy. Mercy is stronger than judgment. He says, have mercy upon me, son of David. The next verse. Then many warned him. Can you imagine? He is a beggar. He's really a loser. In most people's eyes. Now they start to put pressure on him. He's sitting. He's not even standing. So I can just see the people. Shut up. Quiet. Shushi. Mamba. Karate. Shao. We're going to get you now. They warn him. They say, be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Now he's not saying Jesus because everybody knows Jesus' His name is Jesus. Now he is highlighting what he received from the Spirit. He says, son of David. <laughs> Nobody had called Jesus that before. But Jesus knows exactly what it means. You go look it up in another place. He's, he asks the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, why? Uh, he says to them, who do you think, whose son will the Christ be? I looked it up. You know what the Pharisees and the Sadducees said to him? They said, he will be David's son. But that was in another place. Just a conversation. Then Jesus said to them, how can he be David's son? If David in the spirit calls him Lord when he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. You know that story. So Jesus was saying to them, listen, you guys are in the system. Are you ever going to get out of the system? Are you ever going to get into a dimension? This is a, I'm talking to you about a, a spiritual conversation. So this man is starting a conversation with Jesus in the spirit. <laughs> He's talking in languages, other tongues. He's talking, I'm talking about a spiritual language. He's having a spiritual conversation with Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me, verse 49. So Jesus, listen, he was walking now with a crowd. There's no power flowing out of him. He's not stopping for that. He's stopping for something else. And he stands still. So Jesus stood still. And commanded. He didn't ask. He commanded, bring that man here. <laughs> That's powerful, eh? That's awesome. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. I mean, they just warned him. Now they tell him, don't worry. Don't tell him, we warned you. Be of good cheer, man. He's calling you. They're trying to now wipe out their, their wrongdoing with now encouraging him here. Yeah, you know, like that way your parents often do that with their children. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't worry. He says, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Verse 50. 
and throwing aside his garment. In other words, the thing that he wore, that he was accustomed to, he was covered with that thing, his garment. When he heard Jesus call him, after he called Jesus by the Spirit, <laughs> he knew things are not going to be the same anymore. I'm not that man anymore. And he shook off his garment. Why did he do that? He rose because it's a new day. Lord, you see me different than anybody else. Everybody else sees me in that garment. I'm not that man. Because you have found me in your favor. And you have covered me with your grace. And you have rescued me in your mercy. I am who you say I am. And he came forward and he rose and he came to Jesus. Verse 51. He says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni. I looked that word up. I've always been taught that Rabboni means teacher. In my Bible there in that place it says, Rabboni means my great one. <laughs> That's what he said to Jesus, my great one, that I may receive my sight. Verse 51, 52. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. And what? He went back to his place, put on his jacket, and he just went on with his life, happy as happy as can be. You see that? And he received his sight, and he followed Jesus on the road. He became a follower. He didn't return to his former life. So the housewife, she spoke to the nations. What did she say? She said, Jesus is the high priest. The beggar speaks to the nations. What is he saying? Jesus is the king. <laughs> the third miracle. To be a Roman soldier, you had to be a person that had to have made up your mind that this is not going to be easy. It's going to be war all the time. Because they were fighting and they were conquering. Those whom they conquered, they had to keep them under control. So can you understand that this centurion that I'm going to talk to you about now, from Luke chapter 7, he is a man that according to his background, he is used to, to bloodshed. He knows the face of death. Did you know that the Roman Empire only started to crucify people when Jesus was born. From that time, till the time that he meets Jesus, he has seen many people crucified. And probably he himself has been in charge of a crucifixion. When you have been faced with these things, on the inside, things become calloused. You are not moved by people's suffering at ground level. Now, when he concluded his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, verse 2. And a certain centurion's servant, comma, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. How can he have a soft spot for a servant? <laughs> How is this possible? There's something wrong with the picture. Verse 5. I just want to show you something about this man. He's talking about the centurion, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. This is now what the rulers of Israel are saying to Jesus, because now the centurion, who had a servant that was dear to him, he called the elders and said, listen, this Jesus, can he come and heal my servant? And now they go to Jesus, I say to Jesus, listen, this guy's really worth it, you should come. For he loves our nation, he has built us a synagogue. If Julius Caesar found out about that, big trouble. You're not supposed to love the people that you conquer and build them nice religious buildings. You're going to lose your promotion. You're going to be demoted. Come on. Why am I saying this? I'm telling you that here is a man that is living a life on the outside that is forced to live, that is completely different than what he is on the inside. That is a message. How many people are living a life today 
They find themselves in a job situation. They say, this is not what I want to do. This is not who I am. I want to do something else. I hate computers. I, I want to be a farmer. Somebody else says, well, you know, I, this is not, I don't want to work in the government. I don't want to sit in an office. I, I, I want to play music. People do things on the outside, but on the inside, they are a different person. Here is a man. He's forced to be a soldier. He's actually done so well. He's been promoted to being a centurion, but on the inside, he is tender-hearted. How do you do this? So he's someone else on the inside than what he seems to be on the outside. How many Germans do you think in the Second World War that were in the system where they were doing what they did for Germany and for the motherland, killing people all over the world, but on the inside they were crying because they were tender-hearted. And they didn't know how to get out of the system. So here this man comes. And he asks the, the leaders, they say, can you, can you ask Jesus to come? They said, we will ask him. They come to Jesus and say, Jesus, this guy's really worth it. Jesus says, I would like to meet this man that built us a synagogue. How much money did he spend at the temple? No, nothing, Lord. He didn't spend any money at the temple, just the synagogue. Why would this guy invest money in building a synagogue but not spend any money in the temple? Because the temple, you had to go to the temple to pay for your sins, bring sacrifices for sin. This man had hope in a new life. In the synagogue, they preached the word. <laughs> so he was word sensitive he was word driven he was word focused because the word spoken in the synagogue spoke to his future so the housewife her message to the nation was jesus is the high priest the blind beggar bartimaeus his message to the nation was jesus is the king the centurion his message to the nation is, Jesus is the prophet. He governs the realm of the word. Just speak the word. Three miracles show us who the Son of God is.